All right. So um, let me just say a few things while this artwork is still up. We're looking at a Kandinsky, Vasily Kandinsky. Um, yeah, <laughs> Pablo's giving me a wave there. And I am going to um, believe that, Tina. You guess that, Tina, right? Um, I'm going to keep this a mystery, particularly the title throughout this whole thing. And this is particularly for the people who are gonna sign up because we're gonna delve a little deeper. If you want to know more about this, if you're like, Hannah, I'm not gonna be able to take your class and I wanna know about it, I'm gonna give you my email and you can email me and I will send you the title. But I wanna keep this a little bit of a mystery because that title does some interesting things, I think, for us as the viewer. And I really wanna hold that in my back pocket. For the for the future uh, for future students, but again, if you can't take the class, email me, and I'll, I'll I promise I'll send it to you. I'll even send you a fun link. Um, but but one of the reasons why I started with Kandinsky is Kandinsky is considered one of the pioneers for abstract art, abstract modern art. Um, and even though he kind of he marketed himself, this is an early marketer, he marketed himself as the pioneer, as the first abstract artist, which has really become contested now. Um, he still is a really important person to, and a joy, I think, uh, personally for me to look at. Um, and so I thought it was really appropriate. Okay, so we're gonna put this down for just for now so I can look at your beautiful faces. Um, and again, welcome you. So for those of you who are coming in and are new to me, some of the Baylor students, I just wanna introduce myself. My name is Hannah Wong. I got my PhD from UT, um, the University of Texas, specifically in art history and modern art history. Um, so this is the period in which I'm teaching this class. So some of you have taken classes from me, every single class I've taken, whether on the, in the Blanton or online. And so there are some things that are overlaps, but what I'm really excited about in this class is to dig deep into this concept of abstraction, okay? And um, I'm gonna hop right to pretty quickly to a slide, but, um, but I wanted to kind of set out today. So not only is this going to be a preview of this class, right? What I'd love if, if you're not able to take this class in the future with me um, is that you walk away from this with at least your curiosity peaked and maybe two basic frameworks for approaching modern art, particularly abstraction, right? And um, I want y'all to know, and I'm going to show you evidence of this right away, we'll, we'll go right back to this PowerPoint, that um, in this class, when we focus on um, modern art that is abstract art, um, we're taking a particular slice at modern art, because throughout the modern period, and I'm going to name it as basically mid 1850s, like 1800s to mid 1900s, that's going to be the sort of modern period that we're ballparking. During that time and throughout, there is representative art with figures in it, right? So some of this stuff might look very familiar, particularly these two. Um, but you know, you can you might think of if you're familiar with Frida Kahlo, clearly a modern artist, and she's doing a lot of figures that you would recognize, oh, that's a human being, that's a self-portrait, so on and so forth, right? Or looking at this with the Georgia O'Keeffe, that's a flower, all right? So, so these things are happening at the same time in which we are digging into this slice of abstraction. How did this come to be, right? And by the way, just because a little side note, just because you're looking at a thing like a flower, is it really a flower? Okay, so anyway. So there, there are concepts even in representational art that have that sing with abstract art, right? Where are you looking at what you're looking at? What are we looking at? Are we looking at a flower? Are we looking at a person? And this concept, which is really deep, it's so interesting in my personal opinion, goes back all the way back. So what this class is gonna do is, it's not claiming we're gonna learn all the things about all of modern art. We're certainly not. Um, and certainly the cases for today. What, what we're gonna be looking at um, are what, some of the kind of frameworks I'm gonna be presenting. They don't work for absolutely everything for absolutely all modern artists, 
But the wonderful thing about saying something like, let's take a look at these two big frameworks, two keys to looking at abstract art, is you get this kind of bird's eye view, maybe some baskets, containers in which I hope might be useful, even if you don't take this class, okay? So that's kind of the aim. They might not work for absolutely everything, but they're really, I think, helpful um, things to think about and that I have learned after having studied it and taught it for years at the college level, um, modern art, that these, there seem to be common stumbling blocks to people accessing abstract art. And um, I wanted to kind of also throw out why abstraction, why focus on this, right? And one of the big things is that um, this is one of the major innovations uh, to, um, to uh, the modern art world um, in the 19th and 20th century and even in the 18th century, well, sorry, 19th and 20th and 21st century, abstraction is this innovation that we come to, right? After hundreds of years of representational art where you can pick out like, there's Jesus. Okay, I see that's a self-portrait. Okay, that's fruit. All of a sudden, these things go up in the air. Why, right? So this, this concept, this innovation, or you might say, maybe it's not even an innovation, it's a rediscovery because you can go back into the West or outside of the West, for instance, in China, um, abstract art has been happening for many a year, right? Um, but there's something about what's happening in the Western canon in the 19th and 20th century. And, and what we wanna do is dig in. The second thing is, this is part of my own interest in calling, is that it tends to be a stumbling block, right? When we look at things like this, people tend to get frustrated. They tend to get frustrated. There's a challenge to this, right, about looking at art like this. And one of the things I love to do is help people have access to these things because I don't think they're just meant to tick you off. Okay, abstract art was not created. And, and sometimes it feels that way. Are you just doing this to be smart or like to pull one over on me, right? And so we can't have access to this expression that took over the art world for basically a, over a hundred years. And so if you are challenged by this and you have to dismiss it, that means a hundred over a hundred years in which you can't jump in. Right, so that's the reason why abstraction. I'm kind of diving in, and welcome for those who are who are joining us again. Um, I want to ask you now, okay, with this Kandinsky that we were just doing that two word check in, if you would again jump into the chat and name for me, and I'm going to put this. I'll put the question in the chat box. If you would list a challenge, a frustration, some skeptical something that you've heard about in relation to abstract art, you might be inspired by looking at this Kandinsky, that is something of your own, or if you have no problem with it, you're like, I love abstract art, no problem here. Um, what are some of the things that you have heard as a challenge uh, to diving into abstract art? So let's just list that, because if I'm gonna go into these keys, I would rather that I'm speaking in relation to stuff, you know, what are some of the challenges, right? Like maybe I'm making it up, but I have a feeling I'm not. So let's see what some of these things, right? Lorraine, ah, docent, right? Who's, who's saying this, a docent at the Blanton. My child could do that. Ellen's pointing that out, my kid could do that. Judy saying like, oh, it's just hard to understand. Or Karen saying like, what does this mean, right? I've actually had students say that. Neil, right, this isn't beautiful. I don't, I don't find this beautiful, right? Dalton is saying, yeah, finding connections to reality, right? It's kind of sometimes hard to do that. Tina, yeah, Tina was say, is saying like, right on, I hear you, Lorraine, uh, about the anybody can do it. And Bill kind of is, is hopping on with Neil. This is ugly, okay? Leslie, yeah. So Leslie enjoys abstract art, but knows that many want to be able to identify. There's something about wanting to know what this is, right? Benton talks about here, uh, want, it lacks order or rules or definitions, it seems like. Linda saying, what is it? Julianne is like, how is this art? Okay, and I'm seeing that someone raised their hand. So I'll pause. Um, I don't know if that means you want to speak. Um, 
whoever actually that, that was a mistake i'm oh, sorry i'm trying to type something no problem no problem mary okay cool cool okay so you know this Julianne is saying like, how is this art? Again, how does this make, this doesn't make any sense, Ellen is saying. Mark is saying, yes, is this artist trying to pull one over on us, right? Are they trying to feel, pa Pablo's saying, you feel like just feeling angry at looking at this. And boy, have I had some students be angry in my class about this. Judith is saying, resolving my issue of skepticism and maybe incorporated into my art. That's interesting, okay. Janet tapping into emotions. Janet is also a docent uh, at the Blanton. And so like, does looking at some of this stuff, you know, tap into some emotions. And Janet, I've been with you on the floor and you've been around people who have had emotions, right? Um, yeah. And uh, Martha, <laughs> right. If, 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 if this goes, if what we're looking at goes is art then we could hang anything up there, including poop, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Mary's talking about this. It's not accessible. So all these things that are blocking us from getting into it. Right. And so, man, I, boy, I, I really, really want to, um, I'm trying to get these things, man and boy, sorry. Wow. Uh, I, there's so much to riff on here. And, um, and so it partly makes me want to change right in the middle, but but I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with my two keys, um, and I'm going to uh, let's see let's just kind of dive into an overall thing. Maybe I'll keep this this thing up and just sort of overall. If I had to say before I even dive into these two keys that are gonna help us unlock, is if you had to walk away with kind of one phrase that I would love ringing in your brain as you're walking through these galleries, whether or not you love modern art and particularly abstract art or not, it would be this, is that abstract art and sometimes not even abstract art, right? Even those flower paintings from Georgia O'Keeffe, what they require is a different relationship with your eyes, okay? Than what had happened previously. So for instance, okay, so this is, again, I put that little question mark. And in fact, maybe I'll do that. Let's see if I can do that. Oh, I can't, I don't have access. Let me type it in. Here is my email address. <laughs> if you are not gonna take this class, email me and I will tell you, I will tell you what this painting is. If you wanna know about it, and I'll even send you a link. If you take the class, we're gonna dive into this even more, okay? Um, but it's at the Tate Museum. All right, so, all right, so, so a different relationship with our eyes than had had been, had been previous. And it's often a relationship that is uncomfortable, all right? It's uncomfortable to our, our natural way of being, if I could speak sort of universally, which is always dangerous, but you know, I'm gonna do that. It's uncomfortable. I would argue that at least for the Western eye, this is actually, actually, this is interesting, very culturally bound, because I've talked with my mom, who was trained as an artist um, and, and, and um, feels comfortable with Chinese landscape painting. It's very natural. So, and, and that tends to be more abstracted. So I'm speaking from a Western uh, uh, bias, but being raised in the West, in the United States, and looking at things like Perugino's delivery of the keys to St. Peter, when we look at something like this, um, together, if you are from my point of view, so again, I'm using this sort of broad speaking thing, which is dangerous. When we look at this, it is possible that you might say, all right, this feels a little more comfortable, right? Like what I'm seeing and taking in with my eyeballs here, I recognize as possibly something I might, well, you might, you might not be seeing Jesus and his disciples walking around in this uh, European looking setting, but there's something about this that connects to possibly feeling like you can identify it. Those are people, they're not aliens, they're not blobs of paint, right? All that kind of thing. So the first key that I would say that falls under this concept of different relationship with your eyes that might be uncomfortable, might be uncomfortable for you, is that heads up, modern artists were having a genuine conversation with themselves. You, you'll see in their writings, they're struggling through it with one another 
right? So these avant-garde artists are having the struggle with one another and asking the question, this sort of challenge, what if the visual language, the ingredients of art, so by this I mean, for instance, brushstroke or line or color, and there's more, composition, you could talk about pictorial space, all these different things. What if those basic ingredients were the subject of art, the real subject of art and the exploration of art, rather than it being a vehicle to telling a story that happens off of the canvas, okay? So in and of itself, what if brushstroke itself could be the subject of exploration in art. On this side of it, whether or not we feel comfortable with abstract art, because it's been like over a hundred years since this has been out there, this is not necessarily something that's like a wild idea for us, right? Like, of course, I mean, a painter could get up there and sort of brush the, you know, we've seen the, the, this, this caricature of the artist, the wild artist who she's slapping the paintbrush on the, canvas or she's taking a bucket of paint and throwing it against the canvas like we've seen these things and whether or not we think they're silly it's still in our brain but you have to think these artists are coming from this kind of tradition down here at the bottom right where you don't use paint to explore paint you use paint and art to convey big ideas or explorations of concepts that you're not paying attention to the ingredients of artwork. So this is a crazy wild idea. It's absolutely new. And in fact, you can tell, and this is what's exciting. So, so for some of you who have taken this class with me, we kind of talk about these things as a framework. This is really great. In fact, some of these slides might look familiar. But what's really exciting, I hope, about this class is we're going to dig a little bit deeper into seeing some of the artists really going, if you don't know the end of the story and you're messing around and you're kind of swirling paint on a canvas like Van Gogh is doing, and you're getting people going, what are you doing? I don't even know what you're doing. <laughs> this is crazy. Then this idea, this concept of going, I kind of want to break down and examine how color might be expressive in and of itself. It's not the means to an end. It's not like, huh, what if the only way to show love is to paint a Cupid or to show spirituality by showing an old white guy with a beard floating in a sky? That's the only way to show spirituality. What if we used color to do that? What if we used line in and of itself, not to tell this story, but to evoke a relationship with the viewer. Can that be done? I don't know. Let's try and put it up on a gallery wall. And a lot of times the, the artists themselves stand back and go, I don't know if I did it. I don't know. Did, did I do it? Is color communicating to this other person? Um, so, so there is this kind of experimentation, which is one of the reasons I am most excited about modern art. Like, this is really fun to think about it in that way and go, why did I, why, why did I major in this thing? And a lot of it is because you can feel artists going, I hope this works. I think it works. And other artists going, I know it works. I know that blue communicates X to other people. Right. And, and then you've got sort of the old guard going, what, like, we don't even know what you're doing we're actually like worried for you. We actually think maybe you've become insane, right? So, so there's this whole idea of, of a different kind of exploration, right? And um, I wanted to show you this, which is a um, Donald Judd. And Donald Judd was, um, is actually, in my opinion, the um, ultimate conclusion, so he worked in the 60s and 70s prominently, but all the way up, up you know, all the way up into this contemporary period. Um, and, and he has a particular, there's a particular relationship that the Texans here with us have, uh, which is that his artwork forms sort of the nucleus to um, Marfa, Marfa, Texas, and the art world there. He kind of created this whole world. And in fact, side note that I'm letting you in on 
this class could really be called On the Road to Marfa. Because also side note, Hannah has a dream of leading a trip one day, one day to Marfa. Um, and this is kind of a preparation. Yeah, Bill, right? Um, as a preparation, like how did we get there? So when we look at Donald Judd, so I'm giving you an example of this Donald Judd here. Um, he is the extreme example of, in fact, art is not about painting the world off of the canvas or outside of the sculpture. Art is all about the formal qualities. And by form, I literally mean its color, its shape. It's the way that it takes up space, so on and so forth. That's all that art is. All the other stuff is deceit. That's extraneous stuff. That's not really where art is going. That's something that can be said elsewhere. You can tell that in literature. If you want to tell a story, tell it in literature, right? Or in history, right? Art is about, and, and this is, this is starting to bubble in the modern period, is about the things that only art can do, the art materials, right? That's what it is and the impact on the viewer. So, so, this, so, so if what you're thinking about is when I look at these blobs of paint or like, what is this blocks of color? <laughs> I don't understand how this is a sculpture, right? The reason why that's a stumbling block is if you're in your mind thinking, are these folks actually trying to convey the outside world in the way that my eyeball takes it in, like imitative or mimicry? If that is what you think that these artists are trying to do, then you're absolutely right. They have failed utterly, right? Like this is not a great sculpture, Benjamin Franklin or whoever, right? This is, and but that's not what they're trying to do. So whether you agree or disagree, this is a major thing that they're kind of struggling with. And Donald Judd becomes the absolute epitome, in my personal opinion, of that. Okay, so then the second key that I would argue for is this interest, and I'm going to go back here, in the unseen um, world. So when I say there's a different relationship with your eyeballs, right, um, it is into like, instead of art being this kind of thing in which we mimic or act like a camera, right? Um, if, if painting is just about a recording device, <clears throat> well, A, the photograph is coming in strong and it's gonna be a problem during this period if that's the only thing that art is. But even setting that aside, there's this increased interest in seeing things that you can't see with the naked eyeball. And by that, I mean everything from the material world that you can't see, like the atom, right? So in the 1800s, you start seeing things that are smaller that with the naked eye, you can't see, but also things like looking internally. It is not a coincidence that the kinds of abstract art that we're looking at, um, develops during a time in which psychology becomes a discipline, right? And so what, what, what happens is the only way that you can depict love or spirituality or death or war or any of those things by representing something that you can see with your eyeballs, what if there is a way in which you can get to those things that are not like, okay, so for instance, spirituality, white guy floating in the sky with a beard, right? That's the only way we're gonna be able to show God or your feelings towards God or love. The only way we can show love is like people on a swing looking at each other meaningfully and flirting, right? Is that the only way? Is there a way in which we can convey the emotion, the feeling, right? Because I, I, I hope that this is the case. When you have feelings of love or dread or war, it is not just scenes of war. There are, your body gets tight. You have feelings, you have fluttery feelings in your stomach. The butterfly feelings that you might get from nervousness or love or whatever, is that always best conveyed by a butterfly? And even that's symbolic if you think about it, right? So what would it be like if, as the modern artists are kind of playing around with, instead of telling you about love or spirituality or these kinds of things, or modern, the modern world or time, these larger concepts, what if we could, huh, 
make something that when you confront that work of art, we give you the feeling, the resonance of what it feels like to be in love, what it feels like to feel dread, the effects of war, right? So, so that's the sort of secondary thing. So, we, so we've got this one thing, which is there becomes, ironically, this interest in being very literal. We're going to look at how, what happens when we put paint next to this color paint and, and do this kind of line. What is the effect of that, right? Maybe art could just be just that. Whoa. Um, can, can it hold without a story that everybody can identify? I, I don't know. We're still struggling with that today, right? If we look at our chat box. So that's one thing. And then modern art is also experimenting around this idea of what if we didn't show them about a thing? What if we, what if, what if we conveyed or had them have a relationship of what it's like inside, internally, with the un, with what stuff you can't see with your eyeballs, right? So th those are these two key concepts to think about that I think help, um, at least with some of my students in the past with understanding that it's not just these artists being like, you know what, because this is, this is kind of what they think. How can I make another book? You know, I'll just do this thing that they're not gonna be able to really understand and then call it art. And they're gonna be so embarrassed that they don't understand what it is. They're just gonna have to back down and pay millions of dollars for it, <laughs> right? There's a little bit of that suspicion. And so, um, so, one of the ways in which we can also be sort of assured of this is when we look at the artwork and then we look at the writings of these artists, interviews, kind of the struggles that were going on at the time and even their reception. I think sometimes people think that that's like the elite artist who's, who's being like <laughs> stroking their beard um, and saying, I'm so smart and I can't wait to fool them. Um, and not to say that that doesn't happen, P.S., by the way, in the art world, but definitely during these times, a lot of these folks were poor artists who did not have standing and they are really truly experimenting. Um, and so, so let's look in this class um, at some of the things that they're writing about. We're going to dive deep into, not, we're going to toggle in this class between looking at these experiments literally in color and line and, and all that. But we're also going to take a look at the ways in which some things looked the same or similar. So for instance, what we're looking at right here is you, you would think like, all right, Mondrian, right? It is kind of these kind of streamlined, minimalistic things. There's no shading here, right? It's blocks of primary colors, whites and blacks. Um, that reminds me of this Donald Judd, right? Even just working in geometric forms, they've got to be similar. They are not. They are not. If you do the readings behind this, it turns out that if, again, you just use your eyes, turns out that um, these artists were, were aiming, they had different aims, different goals, and that, in fact, Mondrian had much more to do with this Kandinsky, which if you kind of look at the comparison, there really does seem to be a lot more in common between this Mondrian and the Judd versus the Kandinsky and the Mondrian. But it turns out that Mondrian and Kandinsky were looking at theosophy. If, if you've heard of it, we'll go into that a little bit more. But it's this idea that kind of um, all religions essentially um, boil down to sort of the same thing, and also that there's this universal connection, that art is really meant to, to vibe with the universe and to vibe with each other, the viewer, this kind of thing. And that was the, one of the ends of their, of their artwork, these top two artists up here. Judd would base, I mean, he would roll over in his grave if that is what you put onto him. He was actually, in some ways, the exact opposite of that. He wanted you to take a look at his work and consider it as an object and not connect it to some sort of larger whatever goals. A lot of it was just, he often called his work like a fact. He wanted it to be like a fact. So, so this idea of toggling back and forth between looking at these experiments in color and line and all this sort of formal stuff the form itself is what we're going to do in, um, in class. And we're going to say, what did it mean to this particular artist?
to this particular artist group. And it's so fun because sometimes they'll run really parallel to one another. You, you think to yourself, oh, these impressionists are, they're playing around with brushstroke, just like Van Gogh. They're doing different things. They're doing different things. And that makes sense, which is another exciting thing about art and modern art is that they're doing some of the same experiments simultaneously, breaking apart these formal ideas of brushstroke and so on and so forth. But they're coming from a different place because they've got different experiences. They're coming from different cultures. They've got different convictions. They believe certain things and don't believe other things. They're influenced by different friends. And so what's really exciting, I hope, about this class um, is, you know, um, we'll be looking at, we'll be toggling between those like, oh, look at these experiments with brushstrokes. So we'll look at the roman romantics um, who have stuff that we would be able to identify. There's a ship, there's a person, there's a horse, so on and so forth. But then you start seeing when you look really close, wait a second, where are they doing with brushstroke here? And then seeing like, oh, they're, they're conveying emotion in brushstroke here. There's an expression that's happening in that, right? Um, and so, um, Lorraine, are you are you raising your hand? Um, but actually, let me finish my sentence. So let me let me go ahead and do this. But so they've got that, and then we're also going to go into what these various artists are thinking, right? These various artists and these different groups are thinking where they're coming from. Right, so that it's going to be kind of this toggle back and forth. Um, I'll, I'll go into the sort of the final thing, but yeah, Lorraine, if, if there's if you had a, if you had a question, you want to unmute yourself or oh, you didn't. Okay, great. Um, so 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 just to kind of land it, and then I'll I'll open it up to um, to everybody here. Um, what in the end are we going to be doing in this class? Right. So one, we're going to be looking at history. That's something that happens. I'll give you the context of these various things. But what's exciting is I'm gonna start in this class leaning a little bit harder into, um, into how, what do we do with this? I, I, I have some of you in this class who are absolutely new, who have already signed up, or some of you who are, who've taken literally every single class with me. And one of the things I, I wanna challenge us to do, and I know that it's a challenge because I am still working on it, is what can we say when we look at a Kandinsky or a Mondrian or a Judd, if we don't have the background yet, what can we actually solidly say, how do we interact with it? And then at what point do we need to bring in that history? How do those two things work together? Because one of the dangers is you can go one way or the other. I'm just gonna talk about this Kandinsky and without knowing any of the history, I'm gonna say things like, you know, possibly I could go, you know, this is about um, his connection with pure color and he's exploring the rainbow. And if you notice there's primary color, so it must mean so on. And you just kind of go into this floaty world and do this error that I, I, I personally think is an error where you have this belief that I can say anything reasonably about this artwork, anything, anything about it, right? And, and this is a danger, right? Because if you can say anything about an artwork, then in some ways you can say nothing. So like if anything goes, for instance, I believe aliens, this was inspired by aliens. <laughs> you know, I mean, like when we look at the pyramids and people say that, right? Like those kinds of things, reasonably speaking, that is not something you can, I mean, you could say it, but you, I don't think reasonably you can say it. So where's the line between that and our subjective views. When can we bring in our sort of interpretation? Where is that line? That is very, very complex, right? And oftentimes in classes, we don't have the time to skill build that, but it is part of your own independence when you stand in front of an artwork. What can I reasonably say? And where am I going out on a limb? It's cool to go out on a limb, but it's really important, I think, in your approach to artwork to know when you're on a limb right? When you are, are going out on a limb and what you're hanging on to as you're out on that limb. So there are things that are called art labs that I've built into it where I'm going to push into that a bit, where I'm going to be, you know, like I'm going to have everybody kind of independently kind of work on this and we're going to talk, we're going to discuss, okay? Um, so that will be one thing. The other thing we're going to do is lean into some of that theory, right? So if these two things, the Mondrian and the Judd look similar, 
right? In some ways, they've got a lot of formal similarities. Then what are the differences? It's the artist. It's the artist's thinking and their theory. And this is where you get to often also hear the artist's voice. And it makes these things sing, right? You start to see like, Oh, I get why Montreal is doing that. Huh, that's why he's putting yellow next to this black. Interesting. You know, oh, Judd, now I get it. That's why he's not just using primary peri colors, right? I bet you it's also because of this. So that's another thing that we're gonna do. And then sort of the last thing that maybe you wouldn't necessarily get in an art history class, where an art historian is just wanting to talk about the facts and the history, is, and this kind of goes back to that art lab, but I'm gonna push into it in our class, is really what are some of the ways in which we can start to feel uncomfortable with being uncomfortable? So I'm gonna urge some of us at some times to kind of like, hey, this is the moment in which, in which we can let go. You can feel like, just let go of that and maybe ease into this, right? It's almost like a little bit like a coaching. And part of the reason for that is because I want us to be able to enjoy and appreciate or at least feel like we have access to artwork, right? You don't have to love it, but this is something that I love to bring. It's like the feeling aspect of, of art history, but this is towards the end of not just a kind of a hold everybody's hands and have a good time, although that's true, but also I think this is an essential thing to feeling equipped in front of art and not having to always look at the tag or at me, or all these other folks, but to having an independent experience. So um, I'm gonna land this and then, and then open it up. Um, what are some of the big questions we're gonna ask? We're gonna ask things like why after a hundred, over hundred, like several hundreds of years of naturalistic or representational artwork, why? Why are we diving? Why are we moving into abstraction? And how are the ways in which we're doing it? And how is each artist trying to break into abstraction because side note there were several artists for instance picasso very well-known guy who dabbles with abstraction and just decides abstraction doesn't work i just don't think it's going to work uh and so you have artists going i think it's too dehumanizing my viewer is not going to connect with art and in some ways you see that borne out right so what do these artists do to scrabble around it so we're going to look at essentially in some ways case studies of that. And then um, we're going to ask questions like, you know, how can I, what can I, how can I approach artwork on my own independently? So those are some of the big things. All right. So I hope that was helpful for those of you who aren't going to be part of the class. Um, you know, I, I, I hope that this that one day you're going to get to uh, take a class in this or dive in, or this is going to make something about your museum visits. Uh, worthwhile and um, I'm going to stop share. I'm going to give you all um, the website for if you're interested and want to uh, join us. Um, then this is the website to register or if you just want to email me, you can go ahead and email me. But now I'm going to open it up to some questions and thank you uh, for, for joining me. So we might bleed over if you, if at 11.45 you got to rock and roll, I'll just say goodbye to you right now. I, I have time at uh, 12.45, but thank you so much for coming. And again, especially for the new faces and the new names, um, love seeing you and welcome and, and hope to see you in the future.